Otira nga reo ngā kārangatanga maha. A koutou e o te reo pōhiri, te reo karanga, ko tāi mai mātui tēnei, pō, tēnei hui whakaherehera a tēnā tātou katoa. It's great to be here to see in so many familiar faces. I can't remember the names, but the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the faces are good. <laughs> so I uh, really want just to look back uh, in our history a bit. It's already been done very well uh, yesterday and again this morning. But uh, in 2009, I was enjoying quite a good life at Massey University. And at the beginning of the year, I thought I had the year planned out. Everything was going good. I was really calm. And then Tariana Turia walked into my office, <laughs> and the scene changed. And she asked me if, if I would be part of a task force uh, to look at Fano. Actually, she, she didn't ask me. She instructed me to be, <laughs> to be part of a task force. And uh, that's what... Uh, that's what got away. Uh, ten years ago, the task force was set up. Two people there who, who left us uh, too early, but re we remember the contribution that both Linda and Rob made to our report and to the co-papa, even before they were on it, but certainly while they were on it. So the task force went around the country and heard from uh, many people and from some agencies and from some government agencies and uh, then uh, was able to look at what we thought would constitute uh, an, a whānau that was uh, uh, well. They would be the carriers of their culture. That's one task of whānau. Whānau are the models for healthy lifestyles. Whānau are portals to communities. They show us how to get into it. Whānau are gateways to te ao Māori. Whānau are guardians of the land and whānaus are viable economic units. So in the back of our minds, that was how we were envisaging whānau, and we didn't use the word whānau order then, but we were looking at whānau who were well, would have those capabilities. Well, in 2010, the report was presented to Parliament, and uh, it was accepted. Uh, we've had, uh, since then, we uh, almost immediately, Tariana was made a Minister of Fana Water after the report, and then she was followed by uh, Tūrero Flavel and by uh, the Honourable uh, Penny Henari to guard the operation and to guard the kaupapa. A governance group was established in 2010. It had three Māori representatives. I'm not quite sure how they were picked, but three Māori representatives and three CEOs from Health, Social Development and Te Puni Kōkere. It was a strange sort of mix in some ways. It was said to be a partnership, uh, and the three government agencies contributed. They, we came at it from quite different perspectives. They had the biggest chance of forgetting that they were health, te puni kōkiri, or social development, and just thinking they were whānau, because it was very difficult for them to stop thinking about the sector that they represented. It was less difficult uh, for Rob and Nancy and myself to stop thinking about Ngāti Rokoa <laughs> and to think about uh, Māori generally. So in 2011, the uh, Whānau Water Collectives came into, into bloom. There, there were uh, 30, 40 of them almost immediately. They represented a number of independent providers deciding to come together rather than competing with each other, but to work collaboratively. And uh, right around the country, uh, these collectives developed and began to uh, put in place the the uh, water philosophy. And then in, 19, uh, in 2014, the commissioning agencies, the three commissioning agencies, were established for Pacifica, uh, for Tika Māori and for Te Waiponamu. This was a new, and the minister has referred to the, the novelty of this. It was not a wide practice, and in some ways it was a bit of a trial to see how it would go, and a number of people are actually watching Whānau Water Commissioning Agencies closely because they may present a model for others to follow, not necessarily about Fano, but to take on the notion of commissioning rather than providing a service. So the question that, we, that I was asked to talk about was to look into the future. 
I'm probably not quite the right age to look too far into the future, but the, uh, <laughs> that, that was the suggestion. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's really hard to know what the future will look like. And for the rangatahi who are here, the good news for you is that in 20 or 30 years' time, you're going to look just like your parents. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, know, we do know some of the changes. We know that our population will slowly get older. And that's a good thing, by the way, that uh, we will have an increased life expectancy, but we'll still be a relatively young population compared to others in the country. We'll be more dispersed. Many of our whanau will be living overseas or all around the world. They'll come home now and then, but they will still be in touch with uh, digital communication. Disparities will still exist in 10 years' time. I'm fairly sure of uh, that. They may not be to the same level. They may be in different ways, but they will still be there. Cross-sectoral solutions, working across sectors, will have become increasingly important. Not sure whether much will have been achieved, but that will still be important. And we can say in the next decade that Māori leadership in bringing groups together, health, well-being, that'll challenge conventional approaches, and that's what Whānau is doing at present. It's challenging conventional approaches. So really hard to predict what the future will look like, it's even harder to predict what it will look like if you don't know what it will look like. And so I thought what we should do is, instead of thinking about what it might be, we should travel to the year 2029. I don't know whether many of you are into time travel. But <laughs> it's, a fairly, it's a fairly cheap way of getting around. <laughs> but that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go ahead in 10 years and we're going to finish up in the year 2029 and talk about what's happening to us then. And the way of doing it, there's a way of, way of travelling, it's, it's a secret way but I'll share it with you. And I'm going to tell you what we'll do and, and I'm going to tell you soon to close your eyes and then we're going to say tahi, rua, toru, fa, rere, tonu. And when you open your eyes, you'll be in the year 2029. Don't tell anyone because not many people know the secret. So, <laughs> so uh, just close your eyes. You'll find it easier to close your eyes if you don't look at me, so close your eyes. <laughs> then, tahi, rua, toru, fa, rere tonu. So thanks everybody for coming for the annual general meeting. <laughs> The annual general meeting of Oranga Fano. Welcome to our 2029 uh, Hui Ato. It's great to see so many of you were able to make it. I'm amazed, none of you look a day older. <laughs> <laughs> but really good that you were all able to get here. Uh, and I thought this would be a good time for us to talk about what we've achieved uh, and what we're up to it, it this year. You know our history very well. It was 10 years ago since we had that fantastic hui in Christchurch. That was in April 2019. And it's 10 years since we agreed that whānau ora need to move with the times. And it's 10 years since we decided to build our programs to move a, live a gr much greater emphasis on wellness, oranga whānau, flourishing whānau. You also remember that in 2019 we'd been inspired by some of the things that were happening. The commissioning agencies that had been established way back in 2014, they were looking good, and we saw that as a way forward. We also heard from the regional, uh, from the Whānau Oil Review that regional commissions may well be established, and we took that into account, and that the mental health and addictions inquiry had favoured a well-being approach with better linkages between the sectors. In 2019, you'll recall, the government released that fantastic well-being budget. <laughs> And the hearings into the 2575 GD of Waitangi Health and Services and Outcomes was well underway. So here we are in 2029, realising that we have to shift, we had to shift the focus. By 2021, DHBs, PHOs, NGOs, as well as Tamariki Ora and a number of schools had all embraced the Whanau Water model 
and incorporated it into their practices. <laughs> Don't clap too loudly because the, <laughs> the mainstream had adopted whanau water but didn't really understand it and was still locked into crisis mode rather than a wellness mode and seldom involved other agencies or other sectors. But the new trend was welcome because what it meant was that those agencies were involving families in what they were doing. It may have been better to call it a family approach, but it was called the Fano Order approach, and uh, there's both government and community support for it. But one of the worrying outcomes that we had back then, 2021, was that the Fano Order agencies were at risk of becoming redundant as mainstream agencies took over. So at the 2019 HUI, before it finished, <laughs> <laughs> we, we agreed that there was a need to refocus our efforts so that wellness was retained as a goal and an integrated approach rather than a narrow sectoral approach was continued. We were also adamant that our expertise in working with Fano should be given greater recognition. So, early in 2021, we finally agreed that Te Putahi Tanga would have six major functions. First, they would continue to provide ongoing support for the whānau order collectives that had been established. Second, they would develop a whānau advisory service. Third, they would be champions for whānau. Fourth, they would have a united approach to whānau advancement. Fifth, they would emphasise whānau leadership. And sixth, they would run a series of whānau wānanga. So they were the six, uh, you remember, they were the six uh, <laughs> functions that we talked about in 2021. I just want to see, uh, report back to you how we're doing with them. So the first, uh, the first one was uh, Whānau Order Collectives. We will, con and we have always supported uh, Whānau Order Collectives, we'll continue to do so, and that's what our navigators have been uh, excellent at. Uh, the enhancement of their practices will be our concern and our navigators will have their concerns uppermost on their agenda. We're going to help them establish goals and outcome measures and receive funding that enables them to achieve their goals. The second uh, development that we thought we ought to focus on was the Fano Advisory Service. We were concerned about the difficulties of mainstream to engage with Fano, even though they had adopted a Fano order and were saying that they're doing Fano order. Uh, we offered our services to help not by taking over the management of their whānau who were on their books, but providing their staff with guidance and professional development. The offer was readily accepted and a payment schedule was agreed. Thank you, uh, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> and there was support for the government so that Te Pūtahi Tanga was, uh, that's when we first established our formal advisory service and it was widely acknowledged as a specialist service throughout the South Island. Our third focus was to be champions for whānau. Uh, we were monitoring all policies and legislation so that they could, uh, so we could see what impact they had on whānau wellbeing. We were looking at social policy, economic policy, environmental policy, recognition of the Treaty of Waitangi and policy and laws. We regularly meet with local authorities regarding risks to whānau in both built environments and the natural environments and we're working closely with our major funders, Ministry of Wellbeing, TPK, Kiwi Bank and Ngaitahu, in order to agree on priorities and contracts that will advantage whānau. We also champion the rights of whānau, the rights of whānau in education, in courts, in hospitals, in dealings with government, in representation, in employment, and their right to be Māori. So being champions for whānau has become a major part of our work. Then we uh, were a bit concerned that uh, our efforts within Te Ao Māori were getting a bit fragmented. And we decided in 2026, you'll recall, that uh, along with Te Pau Matakana, which was still going, we... <laughs> In, in 2026, we hosted a hui for Māori Rōpū who were involved in any aspect of whānau wellbeing. It was a huge hui. 
It involved the Māori Women's Welfare League, Te Ora, which is the Māori doctors, Te Rau Ora, formerly Te Rau Matatini, Māori Nurses Council, Māori Psychologists, Māori NGOs, Kopapa Māori Schools Association, Te Puni Kōkiri, the Māori Land Court, Iwi Chairs, and many, many more that I couldn't fit on the page. <laughs> so this, we, this approach we thought was important, and there was broad agreement at that uh, groundbreaking hui that whānau wellbeing should be a shared goal for all Māori entities, and Te Pūtahitanga should coordinate the efforts. It, w it was just what Helen had been waiting for. <laughs> so in 2022, we had a second hui and discussed the major obstacles and the major accelerants, what would push it off. And there were recommendations we should lobby for a designated Ministry of Fauna Water, and finally that was agreed by government. You will remember that we all attended the opening of the new ministry in 2023. <laughs> Our fifth function was to look at whānau leadership. And uh, our concern was that uh, unless we build leadership within whānau, we will have failed in our objectives. So we identified the key aspects of whānau leadership, and our navigators changed their focus. They changed their focus from dealing with whānau to encouraging whānau leadership within whānau. And so we saw that our own Fano leaders essentially are part of the Fano. They're part of a Fano. They might be mum and dad, they might be kui and koro, they might be the rangatahi, they might be matu and fire, tūngane, tūahine. Some Fano are lucky, everyone's a leader. <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, Fano, Fano leadership involves a lot of people, and it's sometimes rangatahi tell you about the other leaders when it comes to digital communication but they're not very good at cooking. <laughs> <laughs> our whānau leaders help realise the aspirations of whānau. Our leaders will move from fixing things up to making life-changing life -changing leaps and moving on from yesterday to reach tomorrow. Our whānau leaders help to keep the whānau grounded. Grounded in their whakapapa, grounded in whenua tūpuna, grounded in hapori and iwi, and grounded at home. Our whānau leaders transform trapped whānau into whānau who are free. They lift the wairua, shape the direction, and find a way out. And our whānau leaders connect the whānau. They renew old ties, they bring in whānau who live away, they hold ihui, and they settle old disputes that have lasted for generations. <laughs> Our whānau leaders endorse a whānau koa. They believe that tikanga and rō should play a major role in the day-to-day -day lives of whānau and should not just be reserved for something we do when we go to a marae. But koa within the home is important and that's what our leaders endorse. So what makes for whānau leadership? These are some of the things that we identified when we embarked on this. They're, they're leaders who are part of their whānau. They help realise the aspirations of whānau, they ground the whānau, connect the whānau, transform the whānau into free whānau, they share leadership within the whānau, and they endorse a whānau kawa. So that was the fifth function that we undertook to do uh, earlier on. Our own whānau leaders do not become great leaders by themselves, and that's why our whānau water navigators have been so important, because they have been working with whānau to develop leadership within whānau. And our sixth uh, function, the sixth major function that we decided to take on was to establish a wānanga arm. And we, we had a uh, series of wānanga, we still have them going, right through to Waipaunamu. All of them focus on different aspects of wellness and they're all shaped by the whānau water philosophy. They're also available digital, digitally, so our, our wānanga sometimes are online, sometimes are face-to-face, -face, and they address aspects of whānau life that are important for attaining wellness. And that's the whānau uh, wānanga agenda, whānau at, at whenua, whānau at marae, whānau at uh, whakapapa, whānau at kawa. And I just want to go through each one of those quickly, it won't take me that long, uh, to talk a little bit about what we've found. Uh, the whānau at whenua uh, wānanga that we have, 
people said, well, if we tongue with the whenua, how can we be tongue with the whenua if we don't know where the whenua is? Only half there. So in association with the Māori Land Court and with iwi, we helped Fano establish connections to land. We would do this by way of a wānanga. Uh, the participation in the wānanga exceeded all capacity. We had to put on extra wānanga, uh, particularly in the uh, Invercargill area. <laughs> Uh, many were looking for, they weren't looking to see whether they've got any re rent money owing. They just wanted to know where the Tūranga Waiwai was so that they could have somewhere to stand. Uh, and that was their interest. Others discovered unrecognised land interests that they thought they had, but they had actually expired many years ago. And uh, many were still, uh, really came to the Wānanga to learn where they could stand as tangata whenua. So land was an important wānanga that we had. Another one was uh, whānau at Marae, and that uh, um, even by 2026, there were many whānau in, in living here who were not attached to any marae, yet the feeling of whānau water was that a marae is a critical part of whānau wellbeing. And so we had wānanga uh, with uh, a lot of people and help them make links with Marae, including their links, because you know there's a lot of people down here who come from up north, oh, not way up north, but <laughs> come from up north, and who had also lost contact with Marae, so we involved quite a lot of the uh, Tika Maui people in helping us make contact with Marae. And similarly, Fano at Whakapapa, uh, there are so many people who migrated down here in the 1950s, either to work at the, at the ocean, uh, ocean beach, is it? or other works, or shearing sheds, and people from Te Waipona who had moved north in search of the sun. <laughs> uh, for, for both of those groups, they, they had lost, uh, they had lost um, whakapapa connections and really didn't know where they stood. So with the help of Komata, we provided wānanga where whakapapa could be safely discussed. We thought it was better to do this face-to-face -face rather than online. We were sceptical about putting whakapapa online, so we had a series of face-to-face -face, uh, wānanga. The other one that was important was this whānau at Kaua, uh, that we thought that uh, whānau needed to feel safe in whatever they did and needed to feel confident. And that's exactly what happens when you go to a marae. You know exactly where you stand, uh, who sits there, who sits there, who does the first talk, who does the next. Uh, and that's really all about safety and about knowing for certainty what's going to happen. And so we encourage whānau at these wānanga to adopt a kawa for everyday living in their homes and beyond. And the wānau included a kawa for meals, for settling disputes, for entertaining, for participating in school, participating in work and events. And it also included, and this was an important one, a kawa for engagement with social media so that everyone was safe. Uh, whānau at Kura was another set of wānanga, and uh, we did this because we realised that education is a stepping stone to well-being. So we had these wānanga not for uh, rangatahi or children, but for parents and grandparents. So they could come and talk about the educational opportunities that would best suit their people. Uh, selected schools were also invited to attend. They outlined their programmes and how they were addressing kōpapa Māori, health literacy and equitable outcomes. And the aim of the wānanga was to help parents and grandparents match the school with their child so that there was an option and they were looking for the best possible outcome for their children, which means they had to look at a range of schools in order to do that. Whānau at, uh, at uh, Hinonga, this was about uh, adding enterprise and in association with our nine iwi, as well as it was MB, uh, TPK, Kuma, the Superannuation Fund and Kiwi Bank, we've held a number of wānaunga for whānau who want to enter the business world. The whānau include discussion on, mar the wānaunga include discussion on marketing, fin investment, financial management, professional development, branding and partnership. And the good news people, by 2028, that's a year ago, uh, <laughs> Eight whānau had been successful in establishing their own business and a further six were actively planning to launch new businesses and those six whānau are here today. Sitting over there. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, whānau at Rangatahi, we uh, uh, agree that uh, they will be uh, whānau leaders tomorrow. Uh, they, the Wānanga with them covered a whole range of interests. See, at this group, we're much more comfortable having the Wānanga online than the others had been. But uh, there was agreement that uh, lifelong learning was a major focus. That, will be, that is the normal now for our rangatahi. Tertiary education is normalised. Uh, we also explored whānau rela rangatahi relationships within whānau with friends, with the past and the future. And we continue to be impressed by their sense of responsibility to whānau and to their heritage. Uh, whānau at Hākina Kina, uh, keeping fit, we thought was a, was a catalyst. So we put on a number of very practical wānanga for young and for old about keeping fit. The Wānanga, we, have, uh, we taught people how to walk uphill. It's quite tricky. <laughs> Ki orahi, entering into Iron Māori, going into Waka Ama, working on at the gym, rugby, yoga, and so on. And as a result of these Wānanga, a number of our whānau now are living much healthier lifestyles than they had previously been able to. And whānau at Kai has been our most popular set of Wānanga. <laughs> They've been about gathering, preparing, and eating <laughs> kai Māori, kina, titi, paua, puha, inaka, etc. Very high interest with more participants than we could manage, <laughs> particularly in the Bluff, Dunedin, <laughs> Oamaru, Hukitika, Christchurch, and Blenheim. We were just packed out uh, with those wānanga. The, the practical wānanga were especially popular, gathering and then preparing the kai, but most of all, eating the kai. Then a, uh, another uh, development has been this whānau at Whakatūpuranga, uh, looking at wānanga which look at what's the relationship of one generation to another generation, which is the essence of whānau. And we we've developed all of those whānau, there would be three or four members of, one whā, of, one, of generations who came to the hui. And we talked about their relationships, the, the mutual relationships, how they share, what they share, how they relate to each other, and they all emphasise, they've all emphasised the importance of interdependence. They're all dependent on each other, the young on the very old, the very old on the young. The interalliance between young and old, mothers and children, fathers and grandfathers, komatu and tamariki. So these were really a bit wānanga aimed at strengthening intergenerational connections. So we're really proud of our achievements over the past uh, 10 years. Thanks for all your help in this. Uh, from a time in 2020, when we thought our kaupapa might be relocated within the mainstream, to our current six-part agenda, helping our whānau order collectives, providing a whānau advisory service, being champions for whānau, having a Māori whānau alliance, which extends across all uh, agencies, or Māori agencies, having a whānau leadership programme, and having a wānanga programme. They have been our, our uh, uh, developments that we are very uh, proud of. But our meeting today is over, the huiato is finished. <laughs> and I know you people have got to go back to 2019. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to 2019. And we get there, same system, close your eyes, tahi, rua, toru, fa, and riri, mai. So close your eyes, tahi, rua, toru, fa, riri, mai. So welcome back to 2019. Just check on the people next to you to see that they're... Uh, <laughs> If, if they're looking a little bit older than they should, they're probably still up in 2029. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've talked a bit about one, one future that might look like. There are all sorts of scenarios that can describe what the future is. The three questions are, is it desirable? Is it possible? Is it probable? So if we're looking at these, the 2029 scenario, is it desirable will be something for you to ask. Is it possible? It is possible. Is it probable? Only if you want it to work. So uh, there are some trends that have been evident yesterday and again today and in, in the, the corridor I've given so far and what the minister has said earlier on, that we see that there are some future trends that will shape us as we do move forward. The first one is that whānau wellbeing and whānau leadership 
is a focus, and we need to shift the focus. We shift it from sickness and adversity to a focus on wellness. Shift it from leaders for Fano to leaders within Fano, from Modi order, from Modi Noho to Modi order. So the wellness, Fano well-being, and Fano leadership is a theme that we've heard quite a bit about today and yesterday. A second theme is to do with the affirmation of cultural heritage, recognition that cultural integrity is a core component of wellness. Te reo, tikanga, kaua, ahika, being able to stand on the land, whanaungatanga, mā tauranga Māori, all of that is really important for well-being, and that's part of our uh, mission. And a third theme is to do with iwi participation in whānau ora, and, and Pūtahitanga leads that way, and that you've got good involvement from the nine iwi in Tuaim. Only nine, is there, or another two? Of the, no, it's just the nine. <laughs> But uh, iwi are catalysts for Māori development. Whānau water is critical for positive Māori development. So the, the relationship with iwi is, is mutually beneficial. Uh, Pūtahitanga leadership, the leadership role that Pūtahitanga has, how to pull the threads together, how to keep a future focus and not to get lost with, in today's problems, how to exercise leadership within Te Ao Māori, that is a theme for te, uh, te Pūtahitanga. A further theme is the measurement of out outcomes and whānau, for whānau wellbeing. We're really good at measuring what went wrong. We're not so good at measuring what is going right. And more work to do on that because we want to measure wellness rather than measuring whether there has been, an, uh, instead of just measuring whether someone's got over an illness or someone's got it through a crisis, we want to measure wellness, which is a different sort of measure. And we want to <coughs> think, be thinking about a theme of universal access to essential goods and services. You shouldn't have to wait three weeks for an appointment for an urgent. We shouldn't have to have some people getting service and not others getting service. We want a universal approach to the fundamental services that Māori and other New Zealanders uh, enjoy. The evidence is that we don't get as good access to them. We want uh, national endorsement of uh, whānau wellbeing. Uh, government legislation, government policies, government programs should endorse whānau order, whānau wellbeing. Our local authorities, city councils, regional councils, district councils, we need to be working with them to look at their policies. How many alcohol outlets do you need per head of population? We need to... Uh, we <laughs> We need to be concerned about the state of the rivers that we uh, should be able to swim in and the state of the risks that are in the built environments that we live in. And then we want to talk a bit about an, another theme is the, the need to align within Te Ao Māori. We have a lot of expertise, whānau water is part of it, but there's many other experts and many other groups and we need somehow to see if we can pull these together so that we, and this is what uh, Helen was going to lead in 2026, but, the, uh, but how can we pull these threads together so that all of us who are in Te Ao Māori know that we're working towards well-being for whānau. There might be other things we're working to as well. We might be working towards getting rich. Well, actually, getting rich is, isn't necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> Just makes it a bit easier to be well sometimes. And we're looking for ministerial advocacy we're looking for multiple funding sources and a ministry that is dedicated to whānau ora. And we're looking for a united Māori voice to advance whānau, for whānau advance, a collective Māori voice, a voice for whānau equity, a voice for whānau integrity and for whānau wellness. So they are the top ten themes that we've touched on, uh, that I've touched on this morning and which I'm sure have been discussed uh, throughout the day, whānau well-being and whānau leadership, the affirmation of cultural heritage, iwi partnerships, p the role of Pūtahitanga as a leader, outcome measures, universal access, national endorsement of whānau well-being, alignments within Te Ao Māori, how we can work together, ministerial advocacy, and united Māori efforts for whānau advancement. Uh, I'm not dreaming, uh, by the way, this is... Uh, <laughs> Many of these themes are already evidence. The focus on wellness is beginning to come through. 
whānau ora has been responsible for that. The inclusion of whānau ora in the work of mainstream service providers, however sceptical we might be of some of it, it's beginning to happen. The reconnect with te ao Māori is beginning to happen. The, the advantages of commissioning have been demonstrated with our three commissioning agencies. Uh, the significance of iwi influence and support has been felt. There's room for it to be felt even more. And an integrated approach to Māori development has been talked about. So these things are beginning to happen anyway. The role of Te Pūtahitanga is to cement the gains and take it to other levels. So what I've talked about is uh, looking at the four possible functions into the future uh, that uh, Te Pūtahitanga might be involved in, supporting the Fano Ora collectives, operating a Fano advisory service, having Fano Wananga, being champions for Fano, and steerheading a united Māori approach to Fano Ora. So that's uh, essentially what I want to talk about. Thank you again. Uh, thank all the people who organise this fantastic work that you've done. And I, I know it's not easy to put together a conference of this size. And Minister, thank you very much for your uh, earlier contribution. Made me nervous when I heard you talking. <laughs> but uh, I, I think there's uh, on the same page, I think, on that. So uh, again, thank you. Just, uh, just a, uh, finally, they, they are the key themes that... Uh, <coughs> We've looked at it. If you look closely at those themes, you could call them the Waiponamu themes. <laughs> so, kia ora.